I actually think what we need in the world of change on forest climate uh, for frontline people, indigenous leaders, um, we actually need we actually need more disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, what I see a lot of out in the world is sort of like, you know, either throwing rocks from afar or congratulating people and companies and governments on fairly tepid movement. What we actually need is to grapple with real change, to get into serious disagreements, to take those disagreements public in mm -hmm. campaigns and media work, social media work, and come to a win-win agreement. Welcome to Care More, Be, care better, more, be better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Today, we get to deepen this conversation even further as you meet the executive director of Stand.Earth, Todd Pallia. As executive director of Stand.Earth, Todd can be credited with transforming the paper policies of multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 companies, including Staples, Office Depot, Williams-Sonoma, Dell, Victoria's Secret, 3M, and many more. Under Todd's leadership, Stand.Earth has saved more than 65 million acres of endangered forests. This is in addition to their important work confronting the oil industry and even work in apparel, which we'll dive more into today. Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks, Karina. Great to be here. So I want to just open the door and learn a little bit more about your journey. Saving 65 million acres of trees is a big, big deal. But of course, also, you have a long history of working with Stand Out Earth. So, so tell us about your journey and why are you so passionate to be here today? Uh, yeah, so uh, this story goes way back. Um, so I'll just tell you the short version of how I got started on forest protection, which is where stand.earth started uh, to cut our teeth. Um, I, we moved around a lot uh, when I was growing up and all over upstate New York, kind of uh, living a different version of the American dream. Each time my father got promoted, we would move. Um, and I was in a new school, a new situation every two to three years for my entire uh, youth. Uh, but the thing that was consistent every time we moved is there was always a forest nearby. Um, and that really grounded me. Um, I was a very avid hunter, fisher, um, and it was a stabilizing force in my life. And it's no coincidence that I ended up uh, growing up, becoming a lawyer and really wanting to dedicate myself to forest protection. Uh, and that was really the beginning of my career. So forest protection is almost a, a battle at this point, even with some local forestry services, as we're finding in spaces like the Pacific Northwest, where it seems, you know, they'll take old growth trees out simply because of fire hazard and things along those lines. So I wonder if you could provide us with a brief status for where we are right now, as it stands um, with the topic of forest protection in the United States. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> there have been big wins. So I think it's always important. Uh, people in uh, who care about the environment and the people and the effects all of the various industries and governments have, it's very easy to see the cup as, as definitely half empty. Um, but there's been a lot of major strides all, you know, on the Canadian side of the border, on the U S side of the border and internationally to protect big swaths of forest. And I think we're in a, a moment now of really grappling with uh, more of the reality. I live in Washington state. We have a very progressive governor, Governor Jay Inslee. Um, and the sort of remarkable thing is despite a, quite a bit of progress on a lot of different issues, forest and climate related, if you fly over Washington state, the thing that is most remarkable that you see is just incredible clear cuts all across uh, our state, all across British Columbia, Oregon, and elsewhere. Um, and I think when you look at forests and what they do for salmon, for climate, um, for water quality, um, we have to start changing the way we treat these places. And I think that debate is getting more real. 
Um, little parks and little strips of protected area near streams isn't cutting it anymore. And I'm looking forward to really getting into that debate um, as we grapple with necessity, not just wanting to change things. Well, I think um, you're speaking to my heart here, and I, I really believe that we have to get to a space where we're able to also prioritize what we choose to work on as individuals, because it can seem very daunting. I just published this week an um, episode with Matt Schlegel, where he says, we all need to do everything. And I thought, well, heck, how, how overwhelming is that singular <clears throat> thought? How can we approach things a little bit differently so that we prioritize what counts first to us personally, so that we can make the impact that we hope to make without completely driving ourselves to burnout. So I, un I understand you work on several different projects. Um, I would hope that you could share a little bit about how even Stand.Earth prioritizes the challenges we face and what you choose to champion over a particular period. Yeah, no, that's a great question. There's so much that you could do uh, and so many calls to action all over the place from you know politics to abortion rights to forest protection to climate, um, it's really hard to navigate. So what we do at Standout Earth is we really are con constantly scanning um, what's happening on forests and climate issues and looking for you know what I consider to be sort of neglected areas. Where are there areas where um, people are not working or, or where our particular skills around campaigning, communications, and research can really make a fundamental difference. Um, and so we're kind of looking for those gaps in the movement. We don't want to pile on where lots of good groups and good people are working. We want to find areas where um, things are, are neglected and where breakthroughs are really possible. And so um, one of the things that I always tell people is you really have to find, I think, First of all, any activism is good. Second of all, you have to find an organization that kind of matches your character um, and find out what they want you to do because collective action is always more powerful. That's what we're aiming for, to organize people so that the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So I, you know, understanding how overwhelming it can be to think that there are so many things with regard to climate and protection of earth that we have to do. Um, I would just love your perspective on how you prioritize what you do at stand.earth so that it's not so overwhelming and also so that we can learn from that. Yeah. So what we always do is we, we are scanning forests and climate issues um, in North America and around the world and trying to find these sort of ne like neglected issues. Like where is it where, um, people are not piling on, where there's something really important at stake, but there's not a lot of people and organizations working on it. Or where are there big controversies, conflicts, um, battles over environmental issues, where our particular skills, which really are around campaigning, research, and communications, where we can make a big difference happen. And so that's what we're always looking for, is like, where is, where is there a place where we can really bring something special to change the dynamic, empower local people, and make big change happen. And that's that's what we do every single day. Wow. Well, you know, I think we have a really great example to look to in the consumer product space, which you mentioned on your intake form, which is Patagonia mm. and the philosophy that their founder has had, which ultimately has driven the company to champion open spaces in a way that most companies would never dream of committing to a particular cause so much so that they even became somewhat political and were willing to, you know, lose out on potential customers as a process of that too. Um, most recently they've been in the news because he actually took the entire company and essentially made it a not-for-profit long-term, like they are not going to, profit from their own dollars, their dollars will go into operational costs and then they're funding a foundation. So that's it. It's taking it out of the control and out of the heritage of even having the one day, one day idea of potentially the company going public, which they could have done many times over the years. So I wonder what we can learn from what they have done in your humble perspective. Well, Yvonne Chouinard has always been uh, a, you know, a path maker, an innovator, and what he has done here, I think, has really laid down the gauntlet for all of philanthropy. This is real giving. 
-hmm. This is not making billions of dollars and giving thousands or hundreds of thousands away. Like that is not getting us where we need to get to. A lot of uh, the big philanthropy that happens in the world, um, in some cases, is people who have invested heavily in very, you know, destructive and and uh, detrimental industries, and then they give a portion away to philanthropy. Well, the net effect is very bad for the planet. Uh, what Yvonne Chouinard is doing is saying, we're going to give it all and give it to groups that are cutting edge and actually are asking for fundamental change, not incremental change. And so I think it's an incredible example. I hope it shakes up philanthropy and changes the way foundations and that whole sector operate. Well, and what he's doing in a way too is ensuring that his company doesn't become something that's been completely bastardized from its original concept and and love for the planet um, in a generation or two. He safeguarded that future, understanding that he doesn't necessarily have control over what his grandchildren would choose to do. Exactly. That's no, reality. It's, it's, it's a powerful example. And I'm, you know, we're seeing it send shockwaves through the world of philanthropy. And that is a, a world that is in need of a revolution or two. So I'm hoping uh, his example is followed. Right. So why is so much of philanthropy off base, in your opinion? Why does that happen? Aside from just looking at the examples of, let's say, British Petroleum saying that, I'm sorry, they now rebranded Beyond Petroleum, right? right. Just like Beyond Meat somehow, um, that they are somehow doing the world some good by giving 2% of their um, money specifically to research and put into place green energy solutions as opposed to fracking and other things that they also do. So how do we identify, for one, when companies are truly greenwashing, or if you have some key to that, or when they're being authentic, like the Yvonne Chouards of the world? Um, it's really hard to tell at times because the spin is so polished. Um, I think you know the the mark of authenticity is when a company does something that is really difficult, like what Yvonne Chouinard in Patagonia just did. I don't know of any other example like it where the entire company is given away um, with the proceeds to benefit big change in the world. Um, so I think you know difficulty and authenticity. We know it when we see it, um, and I think what what is easier to spot. Uh, these days is is things that are really not authentic and not real change. So you'll see, you know, literally every year, hundreds and hundreds of announcements about green initiatives that companies are making. And if you just read the actual announcement, uh, a lot of times you can see right through it. Um, often it is incremental change. It is partial. It is for only some of what they do, not all of what they do. Um, and so those easy things are not adding up to the kind of change we need. We need companies and governments to do big things, hard things. Um, and we're at a point in history where the solutions are as big and as capable as the problems we have. And so we can solve the climate crisis and the species loss crisis and, and everything else that we're facing if we have the will. If we have the will. And to a point that you and I have also discussed offline, a big change is hard. It's hardest, I think, for big companies and also big NGOs. Yeah. It's not exclusive to the for-profit sector. And, you know, we'll see this in the consumer product space with somebody like Adidas or Nike coming out with a product that is eco-friendly, a product that is printed with algae ink, a product that might be made from sustainable materials, as with the Adidas Allbirds uh collaboration for a single sneaker that had a lower carbon footprint footprint it comes in it makes it splash they get their pr payment in a way it's like free marketing and then the rudimentary operations of the businesses don't really shift mm -hmm. they don't really change from the extractive principles that the companies has, have espoused because that big change is hard and it's hard to steer a really big ship so I think that sets the stage for why it might be possible to make big change with smaller NGOs, but I'd love for you to speak to that and to give us more color. Yeah. So we were talking earlier about 
you know, what people should do. Like people want to take action. Um, what, what is the most effective thing they can do? And I really think it is to find a, a small or medium sized nonprofit that matches your sort of character. So stand on earth. We're a little spicier than most. Um, we <laughs> challenge big companies uh, and governments. Um, but we also really, our whole approach is if we have to do conflict, we'll do conflict. But we really want to collaborate. We know that we're more powerful together than when we're fighting. And we want to move towards disagreement, towards real authentic change. And that's what we really focus on. What I, my experience has been having been in this field for, you know, coming up on 30 years is that the big foundations um, and the big NGOs, um, great people, very smart, good intentions, but they tend to move so slow uh, and they tend to ask for relatively little. I've actually had forest companies come to me and say, you won't believe how little they're asking us to do in this big fancy, you know, NGO foundation collaborative, or you wouldn't believe how little we have to do to stay mem as members. Mm -hmm. So like as a movement, like especially the big NGOs and big foundations, like we have to be audacious in what we're asking for. It should seem impossible. That's the level of what we should be asking of big companies and governments. And if it seems like it's going to be easy and they're going to make even more money doing it, don't bother. That's mm -hmm. not the kind of change that we need. Yeah. Well, you're speaking to my heart here. In my very first episode, I got to interview my friend, Kara Martinez, um, about her NGO, which is a not for profit called Love Without Borders for Refugees in Need. And she simply noticed um, in her time in Greece that the refugees who were coming through Aleppo, um, and this was their soft landing or supposed soft landing mm -hmm. in Greece, um, were struggling to even get fed in mm. a specific day they'd have to wait in a line for two or three hours for a croissant and a cup of orange juice mm. and so when she saw that level of a problem she started volunteering her time to every time that she came to greece to try and support them and then realized that the big ngos as much funding and money as they brought in they really didn't have the kind of nimble ability to affect change at that grassroots level on location. And so she chose yeah. to take a little bit of that work into her own hands. She just showed up one day and, you know, brought some crayons and paper and some of the kids started to draw children that hadn't been speaking, started speaking again after the trauma that they'd experienced and realized arts can be part of the solution. I'm going to create a not-for-profit grassroots effort and see what we can do. There's two different types of groups, mostly in, in our movement. Those that sort of love governments and companies and want incrementalism. But the equally problematic part of this is those that hate companies and governments, because there is no change without companies and governments being forced to agree to something new in some cases. But like the, the, you know, the idea that we're going to change you know, how people on the front lines are treated, the air pollution, water pollution, climate, everything, but we're not going to talk to companies and governments is kind of ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as thinking that incremental change is going to, you know, getting Microsoft to use 10% less energy is going to change the world. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm answering the question I want to answer, but I wanted to like start over um, and kind of get into that a little bit because I think this, there's this polarization that's happening, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. In your estimation, in your estimation, why is big change more difficult with larger NGOs than the smaller ones? And how do you think we can do this differently? Yeah, well, I actually, I actually think that there, there are dysfunctional parts of both the huge NGOs and the smaller NGOs. Um, and so on the big NGO side and, and big foundation side, there is very slow movement and requests for very incremental change, which will not get us to solving the climate crisis. On the other side, you have another extreme where you have individuals and in smaller groups who are justifiably angry um, at companies and governments and don't want to have anything to do with them. 
neither side works. <clears throat> what works is if we actually challenge companies and governments to do things that seem almost impossible, push them to make commitments and implementation of those commitments um, that are audacious and that we work to then get them to agree to these goals and then implement them. Like that's the kind of engagement and conflict to collaboration we need to see more of, but we can't have, you know, this side being best friends with companies and governments and this side hating them and not wanting to talk to them. We need to all do this together. Well, and how, so, you know, incremental change, mm -hmm. just making 10% less worse of an impact isn't going to really create the kind of goodwill even that we would need to succeed. We need people to really lock arms, work together and ultimately do so with intention. So yeah. how are you specifically able to implement some of this? Do you have a specific example that you can bring to mind where, where you had something like, let's say a big company that was perhaps resistant that you were able to not say topple, but tackle and bring into the fold. Yeah, I, I have a great example of this. Um, so this goes into our fashion campaign. And so if you go back a few years, and if you looked at the climate commitments that those companies were making, I'm talking about some of the biggest fashion brands in the world, those climate commitments applied to their headquarters and their stores. Mm. So let's look at one company, Levi's, um, who at that time, four years ago, five years ago, was making those kind of commitments. 99% of their climate impact is in the factories and in the transportation of the stuff that they make. So their, commi their commitments, with the, which they're putting out press releases, getting kudos from big environmental groups, apply to 1% of their impact. That is a complete ridiculous situation, like totally ineffective and dysfunctional. What Stan did is we came into that sector and we said, no more fake commitments. If you're going to make a climate commitment, it has to apply to your stores, your headquarters, and all of your factories all over the world, no matter what. Um, we helped set the science-based target, which was uh, possibly being negotiated to exclude factories as an impact. Um, we made sure that was part of the science-based target. And we have then pushed companies like Levi's. Levi's made the first commitment that took responsibility for reducing its emissions across its entire supply chain. So every store, every headquarters, and all their factories. We then pushed the entire sector to follow that example and set real climate goals. Now the trick is to get them to implement them, to get mm -hmm. them to invest in wind and solar on the ground in China, Vietnam, Turkey, and other places where they make their products. And that's happening. Um, it's happening slower than it should, but it's happening. But we went from a situation where all the commitments were fake to now we have real commitments. And if they implement them, it will matter for people and our planet. Were you also able to help them address their usage of water? Because I understand that making jeans is one of the most water intensive clothing items that we have. Well, and this is where if, if companies are allowed to do incremental improvements, like let's do, let's use 10% less water for all the jeans that we make. <laughs> it just doesn't really matter. What matters is it, actually what's happening now is as they're being pushed to really reduce their overall climate impact, what's happening is they're looking, looking at investing into what are ways that you can do this that use less water, fewer chemicals, less energy, because that all actually all of those things wrap into them accomplishing their climate goals. That's like revolutionizing the industry, not accepting 10% less damage. And that is beginning to happen in this sector. They need a lot more pressure. They need a lot more adverse media and they need kudos when they do the right thing. And that's what Stand Out Earth is all about. Awesome. So what can we do to your point individually to showcase the successes that are seen and ultimately push for that right kind of change and shine light when more change is needed? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like I was saying earlier, like, Find a group that matches your character. Um, Stand out Earth. We have a million people um, on various platforms and channels that work with us to change company and government behavior. 
Uh, and so if you like what you're hearing, join us. I would just encourage people to find a group that is more on the small and medium sized end of the spectrum, that moves quickly, that is pushing for big change, that is audacious. That's where we need to see a lot of growth in our sector and a lot more participation. If you are really attracted to the giant NGOs um, and you think everything that's happened over the last 30 years, we should have more of that, <laughs> you're welcome to do that. I just don't think that's where big change is coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm right there with you. I, I'm at the point where I am surprised to hear of something great that the Nature Conservancy has done, for example, because I happened to donate to them once and now it feels like all they do is bombard my mailbox with junk mail that I don't want or need. Yes. And, um, you know, I've chosen to direct my donations in a different direction, partially because of that, because of how wasteful it is and how little it seems to stand with earth. <laughs> if I'm going to yes. like be real clear and perhaps give a nod to not only the naming of the company stand.earth, but also the intention behind that. Uh, I mean, I think that, when you have a NGO that is focused on earth protection and resource protection, they should also live and walk. <laughs> yes. Well, we, <laughs> the concept we, of, of minimal we, imprint, you know? We were, we were encouraged many years ago um, to, as we were growing, um, and Standout Earth has grown a lot in, in the last 10 years and even more in the last three years, we were encouraged to start a direct mail program, a junk mail program. Uh, and maybe we could have even grown more. I don't know, but we just couldn't do it. Um, we're not going to, we, we do send mail. If you want a written report, we'll send you mail, but we do not send millions of, uh, you know, solicitations out every day, which some organizations do. I just think it's counterproductive and it is off, off of the mission and vision of Stand Out Earth to do that. So um, we're smaller and more powerful and better off because of not doing junk mail. Awesome. Love it. Now, if there's a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had, I hope that you will ask and answer it. And if not, at this point, I would just love to offer you the floor for closing thoughts and what we what you would have our audience think about as they go on with their days. Well, this is going to sound a little bit crazy, <clears throat> but I, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Um, we are in a weird time. Like this is, this is a strange time to be alive. It's a very interesting time to be alive, but there seems to be so much conflict, bad news um, and other things going on in the world that what I'm about to say will sound a little bit kooky, but hear me out. Um, I actually think what we need in the world of change on forest climate uh, for frontline people, indigenous leaders, um, we, actually need, we actually need more disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, what I see a lot of out in the world is sort of like, you know, either throwing rocks from afar or congratulating people and companies and governments on fairly tepid movement. What we actually need is to grapple with real change, to get into serious disagreements, to take those disagreements public in mm -hmm. campaigns and media work, social media work, and come to a win-win agreement. Standout Earth has been doing that for the last 20 years. There is not one company that we've campaigned against that isn't still working with us. So it's okay to get in disagreements if they're about substance, not about personalities and people. We get into disagreements on the substance and we actually learn from each other. And we often don't get what we were after in the beginning because we didn't understand the industry fully or the company fully, but we get something that is a breakthrough and significant and so what I would urge people is like find groups that are willing to get into serious disagreements um, and adopt real solutions. That's where we need to go to. Um, and that's, that's what Standout Earth is doing. Well, I love that. It's moving from placation to action, right? Exactly. That's fantastic. Now, I just want to thank you so much for your time and for the hard work that you, Zipora Berman, and everyone at Standout Earth is doing to stand for Earth. I think it takes, <laughs> you know, lawyer types like yourselves to stand up and, and have those disagreements and show us how it can be done. Uh, we need to get to a space where we're comfortable in discourse and where we don't placate one another just to have the problem kind of swept under the rug, which is, I think, everything that you're speaking to. Thank you. It was really awesome to be here. 
love the podcast and we're fans of you as well, Karina. So thanks. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's really my honor to host the show and to be able to connect with people like yourself is just my pleasure. So my hope is that we get to do it at some point in future in person that would here be in Northern California. So it's not all that far. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much, Todd. If you thank can stick you. around for just a moment. Wow. What an interview. Now, as always, I will be sure to include with this show notes for this episode, all of the things that we discussed today, links to prior episodes, social profiles, and direct connections to connect with Todd, as well as stand.earth. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please subscribe and write us a review so more people can discover the show. I encourage you to visit our podcast page, caremorebebetter.com. There you will get the blog, including complete transcripts, past episodes, and everything you might hope to from this discussion today. You can even sign up for our newsletter and receive our guide to help unleash your inner activist as a welcome gift. It's completely free, and we only send one email a week, so I promise I won't bombard your inbox, nor will I send you any junk mail. <laughs> so if you have any feedback for today's show, questions for me or for Todd, you can always leave me a voicemail directly from caremorebebetter.com. There is a microphone icon in the bottom right-hand corner. All you have to do is tap it. You can also email me directly to hello at caremorebebetter.com. Thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. We can even regenerate earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.